Today I've got an exciting package to share with you, so let's get it unboxed. This is the Turing Pi 2. It's the successor to the original Turing Pi, and if you're wondering what a Turing Pi is, it's essentially an all-in-one solution for creating a Raspberry Pi cluster, without the hassle of sourcing power supplies, cables and network adapters, and then finding a way to connect them all together. Something which I know all too well from my last cluster build. This is all built into a single board. The original allowed 7 Pi Compute Module 3s to be clustered together, while this new board has a number of improvements and upgrades over the original. The most significant being that it's designed to use the newer Compute Module 4s, so it is a lot more powerful. Its mini RTX design means that it'll also fit into standard RTX computer cases. It's got an onboard managed gigabit ethernet switch that networks the four slots and makes them accessible through one of two onboard ethernet ports. An onboard management controller manages things like fan speed, interface buttons and LEDs, as well as power to each slot. Each slot also has some additional interfacing associated with it. So you've got HDMI, GPIO and a mini PCI Express port available to slot 1. A mini PCI Express port available to slot 2 two SATA 3 ports available to slot 3, and four USB 3 ports available to slot 4. The Turing Pi 2 has four SODOM slots that can each accommodate either a Pi Compute Module 4 through an adapter board or an NVIDIA Jetson module. If you're going to be using CM4 modules like I am, then you'll need to use these adapter boards to be able to plug them into the SODOM slots. These adapter boards also have onboard SD card slots, which you'll need for the operating system image if you're using compute modules without onboard eMMC storage. If you can source the right CM4 modules, you can theoretically create a 16 core cluster with 32 gigs of RAM. Unfortunately, CM4 modules are pretty scarce at the moment, so I have to use what I have available. I've got two 4 gig modules with 32 gigs of onboard eMMC storage. Then I've got two 2 gig CM4 Lite modules, meaning that they don't have the onboard storage. One of these has Wi-Fi and the other doesn't, but we're not going to be using that in any case for this cluster. The CM4 modules just snap into place on the adapter boards. Then there are holes to hold them together with some machine screws, but I prefer not to use these as they tend to bend the CM4 modules if you don't use the right size spacers. On the two light modules, I'll need to use microSD cards to load the operating system. I'm using SanDisk Ultra Plus cards for this, as they're reasonably cheap but are still fast and reliable. The modules can then just be pressed into the SODOM slots and they're ready to go. They are apparently hot swappable, meaning you can plug in or remove them from the slots without having to turn the power off, although I'd prefer not to chance this. Before I plug all of them into the board, we need to do something to assist with keeping the modules cool. I'm going to be using these black heat sinks from Waveshare. They're just screwed into place over the CM4 module, using the four screw holes in the corners. We'll also use some thermal tape between it, the CPU and the Ethernet controller. Waveshare's instructions are for the nuts to face outwards, but I think they look better with the brass standoffs and screws the opposite way around so that the screw heads face outwards, and this doesn't seem to cause any issues with the spacing. Let's add the heat sinks to all of our modules and we can then plug them into our Turing Pi 2 board. With that done, our cluster is basically assembled. All we need to do to finish it off is to plug in a power supply and an ethernet cable. Power is supplied to the board through a 24 pin ATX connector from a typical computer power supply. They recommend using a compact supply like the Pico PSU, but mine hasn't arrived yet, so I'm going to be using a 450 watt power supply from another project. The board only needs a maximum of around 60 watts, so I'll definitely be changing over to the Pico PSU as soon as it arrives. As I mentioned earlier, you can put the Turing Pi 2 into any mini RTX case. So I had a look online for some options, but they were all a bit too bulky for what I'm going to be using the cluster for, and I also like the look of the Turing Pi 2 board and modules, especially once all of the power and activity lights are on. So I'm going to design and cut my own case from clear acrylic. 
I started out with a similar form factor to my water-cooled Raspberry Pi build, but since the Mini ITX board already has screws in the four corners, I could do away with the 3D printed corner pieces and rather make an all acrylic design. I added cutouts for the ports at the back and then cutouts for three 40mm 5V fans at the front. You could rather use a single 120mm fan on the side as a quieter solution. But they're quite thick and the fan will then cover up the CM4 modules, which is what I wanted to avoid in the first place. I also added a cutout for a power button and then some ventilation holes to allow the fan's air to escape at the top and at the back. With the design done, let's get it cut out on my laser cutter. I'm going to use 6mm clear acrylic for the large side panels to give it some rigidity, and then 3mm acrylic for all of the other panels. The panels are now all cut so we can start assembling our case. I'm going to be mounting the board using some M3 nylon standoffs, so I'm going to start by melting some M3 brass inserts into each of the holes on the back side panel. Once those are in place we can screw in our nylon standoffs. I'm using 8mm standoffs on the bottom and then a series of 20mm standoffs until we clear the CM4 modules. So let's screw in the 8mm standoffs first. We can then place the board over them with the ATX power cable running beneath it. This is hopefully a temporary solution and will be replaced by a small cable and barrel jack once the Pico PSU arrives. Let's then add the remaining nylon standoffs to each so that the main side panel clears the CM4 modules. Now we can peel off the protective film on our other acrylic pieces and push them into place. Before we close up the side we need to mount the power button and fans to the front panel. I'm going to be using three 40mm RGB fans that I'll screw into place using some M3 button head screws and nuts. I'm going to leave them unplugged for now as I'll need to make up a harness to connect them to the 5V supply pins. The power button I'm going to use is the same one I used for my water cooled power build. I might need to swap out the cable so that it's long enough to reach the required pins on the opposite side of the board. Our cluster is now almost complete. Before we boot the PIs up, we'll need to load the operating systems that we're going to be using onto each of them. This is where you have a few options, depending on what you're going to be doing with your Turing Pi 2. You could load different operating systems or apps onto each of your PIs and use them as individual servers on your network. So for example, have Pi-hole running on one, Open Media Vault on another, Home Assistant on the third, and a Plex server on the fourth. Each PAR will have its own IP address and will be identifiable by its own MAC address. It'll act in the same way as if it were individually connected to any switch on your home network. Another option, which is the option that I'm going to be setting up, is to install Raspberry Pi OS on each and then install Kubernetes. Kubernetes will have a master node and then three slave or worker nodes and I'll be able to tell Kubernetes what apps I'd like deployed on the cluster and it'll manage the deployment of the apps automatically. So it'll decide which Pi to run each app on and can do things like load balancing and adjust for a missing node if one is removed. So I'm going to start by flashing Raspberry Pi OS onto each Pi. I'll have to do this in two different ways because two of my modules have onboard storage and two require SD cards. 
The ones that have onboard storage will need to be installed on the board and powered up with boot mode disabled. They can then be connected to the computer using a slave USB port and then they'll act like micro SD cards. I can then just flash two micro SD cards for the second two without onboard storage using a micro SD card reader. In Raspberry Pi Imager, I'll be setting the name of each node and turning SSH on so that we can access it over the network to continue the installation of Kubernetes. The acrylic pieces need to be lined up with the slots in the main side panel, and we can then push it down into place and secure it with four M3 button head screws into the nylon standoffs. I'm not going to screw down the main panel just yet, as I might need to get to the modules or the SD cards while setting it up. I connected the fans up to 5 volts from a USB port, so let's try boot up our PARs and continue the installation of Kubernetes. When you push the power button, the board's management system starts up each PI in succession. There are a number of LEDs on each slot and the adapter boards. These show power to the slot, ethernet activity, power on the adapter board, and activity for each CM4 module. So that's what I wanted to keep visible in the case design. I'll go through a summary of the installation of Kubernetes, but if you want to set it up on your own cluster, I'll leave a link to a tutorial in the video description. The Kubernetes distribution that I'm going to be installing is called K3S, which is a lightweight distribution that is designed for use on resource-constrained devices, like our Raspberry Pis. After allowing the Raspberry Pis to boot up, we'll need to SSH into them and install and set up Kubernetes. I've already assigned host names and static IP addresses to each node on my local network. This ensures that each node is given the same IP address every time it comes online. I'm going to SSH into each node using PuTTY on my Windows PC, and I'm going to start by setting up the master node. We'll install Kubernetes on it using a single line with some setup information following it. We'll need to copy our master nodes key as well, as we need this to set up our worker nodes. We now have a basic cluster running, although it only consists of our single master node, so let's log into the other three nodes and install Kubernetes on them so that they can join our cluster. Once we have completed setup on the fourth node, we should have our cluster ready. We can confirm that all of our nodes are connected and available by running the cube cuddle command on our master node. Our four nodes are now available and our cluster is ready for us to start deploying apps on it. I'm not going to go into this in this video, as it'll then be too long, but this essentially involves creating a .yaml configuration file for each app you'd like to deploy on your cluster and then a single command line to deploy it from our master node. Taking a look at its power consumption, the cluster uses around 25 watts once it's running a few apps, and when heavily loaded this goes up to a maximum of about 30 watts. So this is significantly less than running an old laptop or computer instead of the cluster. It's also worth keeping in mind that this is with a 450 watt power supply, so it'll probably come down by about 5 to 10 watts once I switch the cluster over to a smaller PSU. I really like how the case has turned out. It's simple, protects the Turing Pi 2, and still allows you to see into it and see all of the activity and indication LEDs. One addition I might make in the next version is some space for some 2.5 inch SATA drives. These could be mounted so they can easily be plugged into the available ports. Let me know what you think of the Turing Pi 2 in the comment section. This board and its firmware are still beta versions, so there will likely be some tweaks and changes made before the production runs. But the good news is that they're launching on Kickstarter this week, so definitely go and check out their campaign. I'll leave a link to it in the video description. Also let me know if you think there's anything that I should add to the case to make it more functional. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more tech, electronics, projects, tutorials, and reviews.